So the idea is introductions. Myself, I'm Mark Reddy, and in the last uh, few years I've been nominated as team manager. My background, well, I'm an electrician. I'm not an engineer. I have spent uh, 17 years as a cinematographer for TAFE. Part of that was being involved with Solar Car Team earlier. And in the last mm, five or six years, I've been teaching electrical trades because I've still got my license. Um, Tony is, as I said, my technical expert, my guru in electronics and things like that. Um, he wisely chose to retire last year, but ended up putting about 15 to 20 hours a day into solar car effort, for which we are extremely grateful. And above us in the um, organisational structure is Greg Bassani, who I think a few of you may have met over the years. And he's been the educational manager for electronics at TAFE off and on over many years. And he is our educational um, hierarchy type person that we go to, but in terms of the TAFE uh, um, solar vehicle project, Greg is our executive manager. He's, he's the one that signs off on things and tells us yes or no. And a couple of the young, young fellas, we rely so much on the young fellas with their enthusiasm and their um, energy. They're really great. The motivations for TAFE being involved with solar vehicles um, goes back a long way. And we have, in no particular order, we have a, a mixture of motivations and it changes, sort of fluctuates over periods of time. But none the least of it is the free advertising that we gain. And um, for people in the public to see us involved with something that's lean and green, high tech, and something that really captures young people and draws them into engineering solutions for the future is something that is part of our motivation for being involved with this um, aspect of technology. <coughs> we gain international exposure by being involved with the World Solar Challenge every two years. And um, I must say that the local media is very poor in representing um, what is homegrown compared to the amount of exposure that is given to us and to the um, visiting teams in their home countries. It's a real um, blight on the uh, Australian media. Um, we do make a point of visiting um, schools and going to expos and such as you guys are involved with, and ladies, sorry, <laughs> people are involved with in the um, Science Alive and those sort of expos and they are a big priority when we are putting our energy to go to places. We, we really love to be there. Enthusing the young people into the um, technology courses. Um, yeah, the, um, the skills that we develop amongst the students and staff and um, other people that join in the project is another uh, motivator for us. We do um, have a few um, retirees or sometimes formal volunteers that come and they've gone off and got jobs on the back of their experience they've had with the solar car project. But the young people, and I'm thinking particularly of our, our young golden boy, um, Will, who is in the workshop with us any time he doesn't absolutely have to be anywhere else, to the point that some of his lecturers chase us if he's supposed to be in class and hasn't been seen for a while. So. And that sort of dedication to the, to the crew and furthering his knowledge, he just slurps up like a sponge anything that you want to ask him to, to do or to learn. 
He follows the mechanical people around, he follows the electrical people around, he follows the electronics people around. And you only have to show him once and he's onto it. You know, he really seems to understand and think ahead beyond what you've just told him. It's wonderful. And of course, we love being better at solar vehicles than the universities. If you were watching the results last year with the World Solar Challenge, we were the ones that started, we were the ones that finished. Out of the South Australian teams, the universities didn't quite do it. So we love being better than the, the unis at solar vehicles. Track record. Now having said that last statement, it was a syndicate with UniSA that got us started in solar vehicles back in 99. Um, we had a couple of high schools, the university, TAFE, and I think a couple of industry groups involved at that stage. We had a syndicate and the uni had already created a vehicle called NED and the one that you see in the picture, the yellow one, is Kelly, which came off the same mould. So we got together and we built that in late 99, early 2000. Um, but in 99, I was privileged to be part of a team from Woodville Special School that competed in the World Solar Challenge, and that gave me a bit of a taste of the actual competition environment. So 2001 we fielded Kelly and Kelly was sort of um, not quite finished when we got to the starting line. It was touch and go as to whether they would actually let us run on the Sunday morning and it boiled down to a trafficator relay. The uni boffins wanted to create a low energy relay thingy with integrated circuits and they could never get that thing working and I was there as media representative just running a camera and everybody's running around and I eventually stomped my foot down and said don't be idiots get down the servo and just get a 12 volt flasher and put it in there so finally they did and that gave us 20 minutes before the actual flag was <laughs> to go off but 2001 was fraught with a lot of danger for us because us tech heads um, didn't think about the fact that carbon fibre is conductive and we glued solar cells straight onto carbon fibre shell and so every so often they would rub through and start catch fire and yes it was fraught with trouble so but that was our start into solar car racing. In 2003 through to 2009, we ran Kelly very successfully. Kelly got a first place, a third place, and a fifth place in the World Solar Challenge. And it was among the very first to have more than one seat. So we're very proud of the history of Kelly. And we learnt a lot about the competition. And each other, I might add. Um, <laughs> 2001, 2009, oh, during those years, uh, 2003 to 2009, I took a break from the team because my other workload was just a bit too much and uh, the demands of the team uh, just didn't seem to be manageable for me. But maybe that's why they got on and got good placings, I don't know. Um, 2009, we um, felt that it was time to retire um, Kelly for various reasons, I'll, I'll go into that in a bit, and we determined to build Solar Spirit 1. And a few of you may have recalled seeing a thing that looked like a, a grasshopper with a flat array over the top which could be tilted. It was shown at a few expos. I actually drove it on a test track but it never made it into the competition because it was deemed not finished and not safe to leave town. Um, so that 2009 was mm, not good for us. We disappointed some sponsors that never will touch us again. Uh, but once again, we learnt a few things. So 2011, we created the red one down the bottom, a Solar Spirit 2, which 
ran in its first year with the motor out of Solar Spirit 1, which is a f mm, two kilowatt CSIRO kit. We found it was underpowered for the weight of the machine because in building this body, we did so over the bottom shell and tub of Kelly. And we added weight to the whole thing in doing so. And we were underpowered. So um, 2013, we added the old motor out of Kelly, which is an NGM motor, five kilowatt. So we ended up with two motors. Not particularly balanced, but that don't really matter. If you switch it right, you can treat one as a high power when you want to go up the hill and switch the other one for coasting on the flat. But notice there's a trick, there's an if in that. We didn't ever get that quite right either. So uh, we competed reasonably successfully in 2015. We got a first placing in our class in 2015. And um, in that year, we decided that various parts of Solar Spirit, particularly the ones that were older, a legacy from Kelly, were starting to show signs of being unsafe and failing. I'm talking more particularly about the joints of the carbon fibre um, tub to the carbon fibre floor pan and um, suspension which was made for a 400 kilo vehicle and we were toting about a ton by this time. So you know, we were having failures and we felt we did not want a catastrophic failure on the road. So we determined to build a new vehicle. So in 2017, um, we fielded a vehicle that we nicknamed SAV. I'll speak a bit more specifically about SAV now. So we have a certain design philosophy at TAFE. Um, we want to be able to meet the specs that are published by the World Solar Challenge for at least one of their categories. And they've got two or three. It varies a bit from time to time. We want to run the whole distance by solar power. That's part of our design philosophy. Uh, of more recent years, we haven't actually performed that all that well. We like to purchase off-the-shelf components so that where possible um, the public can see what we do and take it on board and think, oh yeah, I could probably do that or something nearly like that. To be inspiring and we want to create a vehicle with public appeal. We have seen over the years, since 2001, that crowds just love our vehicles. So we think, well, what's next? And we have a habit, it seems to be, our crew likes to hole up on the way back from Darwin. <coughs> on that last night out in the country, we like to hole up at Crystal Brook at the caravan park and just get ourselves ready for a gentle run into Adelaide on that last day. So at camp around the campfire that that particular night, each competition, we tend to sit down and have a bit of a brainstorm and say, what, were we on to, what do we want to do? So this time we said, well, what do we want to do in 2015? We said, what do we want to do for 2017? And some mug said, oh, let's build a truck. Uh, and uh, yes, and most of us had the same response, we laughed. But the more we thought about it, the more we talked about it, the more we figured it fits all these things. It meets the specs, it's solar powered, we can use off the shelf components to do what we want to do to achieve our goals. It has public appeal. Well, you think of the public love affair with the Aussie ute, huh? and trucks, you know, our nation doesn't get along without trucks. You know, public appeal, so we figured what's next. We've got all of that, a truck. And that was what was presented to us as an inspiring um, image to start with. <laughs> it's a real truck and Tesla sort of took a leapfrog from it, didn't they? But this was publicised as a sun-powered truck, but it's not really a sun-powered truck. 
However, the streamlining and some of the um, imagery there of, of the shape and the um, futuristic stuff, we thought, or oh, maybe some of those design elements might help us along. So we did a fair bit of Photoshop work and a lot of hand modelling because we don't have too much expertise in CAD in our team and we came up with a prime mover. So the prime mover for the solar articulated vehicle is two metres wide, 1.4 metres tall, 4.5 metres long, weighs a tonne and has a fifth wheel coupling in the tray for a fifth wheel a trailer. And I must tell you, the public and the race officials, everybody that has seen it just clamours over it and slaps us on the back for the execution of the project. It ticks all the boxes. It fits in cruiser class. We got the PV arrays through Tindo. We had to pay for the cells, but they threw in encapsulating the cells and connecting them into modules as support for the project, which could be debated, but it's around about the twenty to $30,000 worth of um, in-kind sponsorship. So we're very thankful to them. We use a lot of Hyondo parts, so um, the wheels, the wheel assembly, the um, suspension is racing Hyundai XL. Uh, one of our engineering team members races Hyundai, so he's very familiar with that. We looked at all that uh, knowledge that he has and expertise, and we thought, oh, we can spring back off of that. We were pitching to build this at about 700 kilos, so. The racing Hyundai is um, spec'd at one ton, so you know there's similarities there, and we could use that towards our build. The um, motors and the um, battery cells, well, they were purchased out of China with help of Australian importers, and uh, that wasn't a huge problem in sourcing them in the end. The thing is jolly easy to drive. In fact, it feels similar in its pickup and handling, similar to my my uh, Mitsubishi Fev in econ economy mode, or uh, a bit of a heavy go kart, perhaps. There's no way you can make it slide when you hammer it around a corner. I tried. It's easy, it's comfortable to drive, it's got good seats, it's got cruise control simulation sort of stuff, huge public appeal. It's designed and intended to be energy neutral with its trailer on, and we can build various purpose-built trailers. So initially we intend, we haven't actually finished it yet, we are building a trailer that will carry light freight, and the whole, whole trailer is supposed to be 700 kilo. But that will have motors in the wheels to um, use for regen braking and a big solar array over the top, I think, is about five kilowatts. And potential for fold out sides, which would be solar array as well. So when you're parked, you can slurp up more sun. So you think of that um, if we were to build a RV trailer under those principles, then um, we could motor for a few hours through the day at any speed you liked then pull up to camp, you know, say two o'clock, just flip up all the arrays, charge it up, have a, a lovely laid back night, maybe let it charge for a couple of hours in the morning, then hit the road. All sorts of possibilities. Um, so this will be about my final slide and then I'll hand it over to Tony. We talk about the major systems, the chassis, which is made of mild steel. You can see some pictures there. Uh, the present build was intended to be prototype 
and it is heavier than what we had pitched at in the first place but um, the project sort of ran out of time leading up to the competition and ran out of money so um, we haven't actually built the light version. The shell, the front, the curved parts, or the front shell is about uh, 15 mil thick of layers of Kevlar, so it's rocket proof. Window, the front window is off of a XL, no, Hyundai delivery van of some sort, so it's a standard windscreen. And the motor system. Well, they're QS motor, which was ordered through um, the scooter place down on South Road. Do you remember the name, Tony? No, they came from China. They did come from China. They had to be ordered up front and manufactured and then delivered. We bought four, thinking at one stage that we may put one on each wheel uh, because they are wheel motors, hub motors. But even before they were delivered, we made a decision to mount them inboard so there's less unsprung weight. That's an advantage, I'm told. And it gives us the flexibility of just making another engine mount and putting a different motor in there if we want to. It's, it's a lot easier to change it over than if we had made a decision to build it as the wheel. I'll let back let battery and battery management system come on, um, from Tony in a minute. Um, the array, as I said, was from Tindo Solar. For the specifications of cruiser class, we're only allowed five square metres of solar array, and that's got to be the cells themselves. You don't measure the little bits of cutoffs in the ends, but it's the actual cell area. So the best we can get for garden variety um, solar cells, roughly 22%, and we didn't pay $10 per cell, we paid only three or $4 per cell. So we got 22% efficiency cells. So you work your maths and you get roughly a kilowatt off of an array when it's put together nicely. And we're using a bit more than that to just propel this one ton vehicle with a coefficient of drag of about 0.4. Um, the controls are based on the Hyundai steering and um, the rack is a Subaru actually because we decided to turn it around from back to front. But the um, yeah, all that steering and controls and, and that sort of stuff is made to be familiar to an average driver. Um, some um, TV presenter just sat in there and she drove it backwards and forwards without much coaching. You just turn the key, you know, like the column key, you turn that on, the thing, all the systems start up, put your foot on the accelerator or on the brake. Things work just like a, an easy to drive car rather than a science project. And the monitoring systems are based on CAN bus, which is very common in a lot of vehicles, and Arduino technology. So our students that are out of um, electronics and programming, you know, they're right into that sort of stuff. And Cameron, I'm thinking of in particular, has gone on to now join the opposition as well as us. He's in one of the university teams. He's a graduate from our electronics course. So that's just an overview of the systems as we view them in our vehicle. And it's Tony's go. Look, I just want to talk a little bit about uh, the electronics of, of this car. I've been with TAFE, or, or rather had been with TAFE for 25 years, sort of teaching electronics and programming. So um, I've been asked to come and help in 2016. I'd been doing some work with the previous cars in the background with one of our other lecturers and that, but I hadn't been out in the front. So it was about mm, about the middle of the 2016. I said, yeah, all right, I'll, I'll do that. And, you know, so I can, I can help with that. So I was committed to it. But then in April of last year, uh, I had the opportunity to retire. <coughs> so I did. <coughs> but 
I was already committed with this car and that wasn't anyways near finished at all. So I spent the next six months after that sort of just every day and night, day and night working on these things. And they don't look very much, but the, the amount of detail that goes into it is enormous. To, and we had to make sure that we complied with the regulations. And they were very, very stringent in lots of different areas to do. So this diagram here, <coughs> I think that's probably working. That diagram there is, that was submitted to the uh, controlling organisation as well. That is an overview of the power management systems of the car. Does this have a, a laser pointer? Yep. Would that be the red button that goes, oh look at that, yep. brilliant. <coughs> Excellent. So those items there are the batteries that were to power this unit up, which I, I brought along a sample here. All of those are just uh, lithium-ion 18650 cells that are very commonly available off the shelf anywhere. We paid about $7 each landed here in Australia. So there were $5 each. High, high density cells but uh, $2 freight on top of those. We ended up with 2,880 cells in the battery so it's a 34 kilowatt battery. That is controlled by this unit here, which I'll tell you a little bit about in a moment, <coughs> uh, the contactors there deliver the power to the motors. These are what Mark was talking about there. Each of those two contactors are rated at 500 amps each and designed for 600 volts DC. So they cost us uh, $150 each. <coughs> so there are four of those in the car. So you see that it starts to add up fairly quickly with the cost of this thing to do. So it's not something you can think, yeah, I'll build one of those in the shed and I've got five grand in my pocket. So <clears throat> I'm sure a lot of you know that already. Uh, <clears throat> all of these batteries have to be monitored very, very stringently. Uh, they have a tendency to catch on fire if they're abused. And um, some, some of the teams can attest to that in previous years. <clears throat> the operation of it that Mark had mentioned was by a key. It was just a standard key on the, on the column and the motion of that was you turn it on to accessories mode and that would liven up the system so that you could see what was happening, the same as in an ordinary motor car. You switch it to ignition and hold it for a second and then the microprocessor would recognise that you're trying to start the car and it would then operate those contactors to deliver power to the motor systems to do. All of that um, and there was a mention about we wanted to buy everything off the shelf and we did as much as we could. However, things like these weren't available off the shelf. We had to design and build those and that's what I'd sort of been spent six months doing was to design these items, program them and, and have them built. So I'd build a, a prototype and we checked that that worked and then we sent the circuit um, off to China. They made the circuit boards for us um, a whole range of, actually I'll, I'll leave those there for the moment and you can come and look at them later on. That board there came back from China, not assembled, we had to assemble that to, when we got it back here. So we have one of those in the car and there's two spare ones in the trailer to go along in case there's a failure and we didn't need a spare one, which I'm, I'm happy about. That is the power control system board there takes 120 volts in from the battery. So these are normally 120 fully charged. It's 126 volts. And at the low end of the charge, it's about 94 volts. So that, I did something. <clears throat> that section of the board there is just a DC-DC converter, isolated one, supplies 12 volts to the board to operate everything else. So that's isolated from the 120 volts. So everything, in the battery has to be contained within a metal enclosure and when it's turned off there can be no 120 volts. This is part of the regulations for the World Solar Challenge. So <clears throat> we're allowed to have 12 volts out of the box at not more than 50 milliamps. So very very small energy outside the box when it's in safe mode. So this section here delivers that through one of these connectors here to the key. So it's a 40 milliamp signal, 12 volts, so that when you turn the key on, the microprocessor, which is a little bit there, will recognise that signal and then can start the whole system up and then it's safe. Once it's in operation mode, of course, we can have the 120 volts outside the system, which we have to do, and that's supplied to the, the motors themselves. 
<laughs> yeah, yeah, definitely. Yeah, so the uh, the inverter section there can run up to 600 volts to, to do <coughs> as an input. Runs from about 60 to 600 volts. So Still, that can, that can be used for any of the run of the mill um, conversions. That were yes, yeah, definitely. Yeah, yeah. It, when when I designed this, um, I wasn't really given a brief, so I sort of had to talk to different people about what we wanted to do, and we try to make it with programming and, and design. I've been designing uh, with electronics since the early 1970s and programming since about the mid 70s to do so. Um, I was involved with the submarine contract there with the Collins class submarines and so a lot of design philosophy went into this to make sure that it wasn't going to be used only for our SAV but it could be easily adapted to other kind of vehicles to do so uh, it, the key input is a standard key on a car um, off accessories ignition and start mode so uh, it takes those inputs to do it can be easily modified simply by changing the program in the microcontroller. When it's in start mode, it switches. Uh, there's a couple of FETs there, which are very, very low on resistance, so better than relays, because relays overheat and vibrate and you know, mechanical problems to do. So those uh, FETs there switch the current out to the, to the uh, other sections that need it with very, very low losses in there. The whole thing was about being very, very low losses all the time, because it's battery operated and solar. So we didn't even want to use relays which have got current in the coil and there's losses there. When it goes into, into the start mode, then these other uh, outputs here operate power to the, to the main contactors. So those big 500 amp contactors operate on 12 volts at about 100 milliamps. So it was, they're the only kind of relays that we have in there. Can be easily adapted to anything else. This section along here was for noise immunity because in motor cars and the motors that we were using were 16 kilowatt motors running at 120 volts, so the three phase motors, five, wow, <laughs> thank you, uh, huge amount of noise, so we had to protect against that. So that section of the board, I bought one of these boards along today so you can have a look at it and ask questions on that if you're interested. So that worked very, very well for what we needed to do. This was part of the BMS board, which um, I was going to bring one separate, and I, I forgot, so I apologise for that, but there is one in here operating at the moment. So that was just a layout of the board. This took an enormous amount of time to design and build. This has to take, again, uh, a section here, which is 120 volts power down to uh, 12 volts and 5 volts for the microcontroller. That job there is to maintain the voltage and the temperature of every cell in a box. And here's one of the boxes here <coughs> that you can have a look at. There are five cards. It's a um, 8P30S set, 120 volts, 2.8 kilowatt battery. And we run 12 of those in parallel in the car. So each one of those boxes is completely autonomous. It has an RS485 communication port on the back, which daisy changed to every other box. And so they all can talk to each other and they know what they're doing. This microcontroller there reads the temperature of every cell in the box and it reads the voltage of every cell. And if anything gets out of, out of whack, it instructs these devices here to balance it up. So it not, not only does it maintain the safety of it, but it balances every cell in charge and discharge. So they're within about 50 millivolts of each. That's... Uh, this is one end, it was too big to fit on one slide. That's the left hand end of it, and that's the right hand end of it, which doesn't look terribly much on there, but all of those sections there are tiny little MOSFETs and um, load balance resistors there to do the balancing. That circuit there uh, is the BMS supervisor. So all these 12 boxes, whilst they talk to each other, they have to be able to present information to our telemetry, and that is collected via this device here. So this, that's the micro, oh, I keep doing that. That's the microcontroller in the middle. It talks via the CAN bus to each of these boxes and it sends out, uh, sorry, RS485 to each box and it sends out via the CAN bus to the instrumentation at the front of the car and also to our wireless telemetry so that the vehicles behind and in front can know what's happening with the battery at any moment, whether it's getting too hot or whether it's uh, undercharged or even if it was overcharged. 
these are simply to, uh, illustrations and to provide some interest to you that you might want to ask some more questions about. <coughs> that was just the layout of that, that board from that circuit there. That's just the layout of it. So what it looks like from that. Um, that is, um, you might be interested, is the, the circuit of the DC-DC converter. So the, in this case it's 120, so 60 to 600 volts in. This has got two outputs on there, which can be configured to whatever you need them to be. So that was, that's what I worked on, was designing these circuits and then building all these things so that we could make this car run. The temperature monitoring was this circuit here. So each of those green blocks is, has eight inputs and they scan through all of the, the uh, temperature probes in the battery. <coughs> That's one of the battery cards. There are five of those. The little white loops on there are thermistors, which monitor the temperature on these. Those green blocks scan all these constantly, round and round and round, and checking all those temperatures all the time. It then sends that information out via these to the microcontroller. So those ones there are used to balance it up and then send the information on. <coughs> one of the items that we had to have, and this is about the last one, is the car had to be safe. It's 120 volts. It's capable of delivering about 1,600 amps. <clears throat> so, you know, you can melt a, melt a half inch bolt in half with that. So we couldn't afford to have any kind of problems. And one of the, uh, one of the regulations that had to be was if there was a fault developed in the system, that it had to be reported. And that's what this did. And so I, I pondered on that for uh, about a week. Uh, all different kinds of ideas and eventually I came up with this and it simply is uh, an oscillator running in that section there driving a charge pump in this section down here and so long as the oscillator is running all the time the charge pump is held low and everything's good. If the oscillator stops the charge pump drains away and it flags uh, an error light on here and the, what would stop it would be if there was a 120 volt failure to ground or if there was a, a negative failure to ground. And then these lights here would indicate for us if there was a, a, a positive fault or a negative fault. And that was to meet the, the regulations. And a very, very simple circuit, but very, very effective. Any questions? Yes, sir? With your, with your single cells, is, have you got each cell fused separately? Yeah. No, no, they're not. They, They sit in, in a cradle, um, eight in a pack, so there's four on one side and four on the other side, so they're all in parallel. So the whole section is in series to give us 120 volts. And the BMS card is fused there, 100 amp fuses on the card. So the, the 120 volts from this comes into, into there and that's the, the ground connection is there, and then um, it's only fused at that point. So each box, each one of these subunit boxes is fused, and... And, and they're welded, are they? The factory's welded together? No, they are press fit in the cradles. They're terribly difficult to get in and more difficult to get out, so... <coughs> Having said that, we have to be honest and say that Vibration has caused us some, some concern. Yeah. Yeah. Some of them have moved. I was just I read on the on the internet quite a bit. There's people pulling old computer batteries apart to get the cells, and they're building their own power packs. Mm. And all the ones that you read, they actually fuse each cell separately because of the fire risk. Yeah, I have seen that. Uh, bearing in mind that these were brand new, and so they were all very very balanced when they're put in. Um, one of our um, helpers, because there are eight in parallel and he'd installed all the cells on one side and then turned it over and it started to install them without, he was talking and not thinking and put them in, oh what's going on and it melted. So he had four and each of these cells is capable of delivering 20 amps. So, uh, so there's four in parallel so that's 80 amps there. So we had four up one way and four up the other way. So we had a dead short with eight volts at 80 amps and it melted the cradle and, and fused the connections on them. So each of the little tabs are only small, but they 
acted really as fuses on there. So in that instance, so he just blew all of those. <coughs> Any more questions? I'm out of your camera view. Sorry about that. <coughs> I always say if you can't baffle them with brilliance, bond them with bullshit. So. Yeah, right. <laughs> no, I think it's absolutely fascinating. My question is, with the 34 kilowatt pad, yeah. what range did you get from the vehicle? Uh, we, got, we got 50 kilometres. <coughs> <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> the motor's overheated. So <coughs> we, um, we calculated with, with everything considered and, and without any overheating in the motor, because it was terribly hot up there, that we should have, we were hoping to get uh, 500, 600 kilometres out of the pack. And then we would charge them at night and then away we'd go the next day. So that's, that was the rationale for all that. Okay, and so is that using, when you talked about, you said you're adding a trailer with fold out panels and that, how would that work? Uh, well, the, tr yeah, the, the, the prime mover had very limited solar collection, so it certainly would provide some, but we would need to recharge at night from an external source. But with the trailer on the back and an extra, was it eight square metres or five, ten, ten no, 16, 16 square metres, I think, eight metres long and, and two metres wide, gave us a, a, a lot more energy, which we considered we should be able to run without recharging. Okay, to answer that question just broadly, we have calculated with spreadsheets and solar radiation and lots of stuff. We've calculated that if we pull over for two hours in the peak heat of the, of the middle of the day and slurp up power, then with the, the race allocation of road hours from 8 o'clock in the morning and then off the road at 5 in the afternoon, we could come across Australia without plugging in. Yeah. Wow. Mm. We, we have, yeah. Is, can you register this on the road? We, we believe so. We're on track to <coughs> register it this year. Yeah. Really? You wouldn't like to drive it to Brisbane towards the end of the year, would you? We have a conference there that's <coughs> very interested in that endeavour. <laughs> mm. You might like to pitch a, uh, a letter to Greg Bassani uh. and the marketing manager of TAFE and just pop that as a proposal mm. that might help us. Yeah, really? yeah, would yeah. Would be something you'd be Oh, well, certainly. We would yeah. love to do that. Because yeah. be yes. late October, early November. Certainly the sort yeah. of... It's certainly the, along the direction that we would like to take. Mm. Uh, you would all have been quite aware of the Tesla announcement of their electric truck and the delivery dates of that sort of stuff. At the moment, there is nobody that says they can cross the nation on solar power only with a truck. We want to be the first to do it with okay. a payload. Mm. Well, we'll definitely get Eric to take the details down. That's how he's here. Well, yes. <laughs> you all know I've been absolutely waiting, can't wait, <coughs> quick mm. enough to get an EV with a tow bar. So, you know, mm. perfect. Yeah. yeah, we've got one. Yeah. Uh, so, so, any other questions at all? Yes. It might be a silly idea, but maybe you could get evaporative cooling in the light on the roof for cooling your motors, some water bag and just let the natural breeze uh, cool, the, cool the motors. Yeah, that would work, wouldn't it? Because the hot... On board. Yeah, yeah and absolutely. The cells make a lot of difference as well, the solar cells. Yeah. Yeah. Question Where's over here? Yeah. Can yes. you put in the extra batteries in the trailer? Yes, we, <coughs> that's part of our calculation for that. Mm. Yes. Each of those cards there, the battery cards, they weigh about one and a half kilos. It's 24 volts, uh, 160 amps capable. For, for one card. So there are five of those in the battery, so each of those boxes there delivers 120 volts and can deliver up to 160 amps. Because we've got 12 of them in parallel, the motors that are drawing our maximum current draw, I think, was about 366 amps, and so that's at, at absolute maximum. So each of these cards is running at well, well under spec, only at about 20% of its capacity. So we don't expect, we've never seen them overheat and don't expect them to get hot at all. What's, what's the battery chemistry? What, what, what are they? Lithium ion phosphate? Or uh, manganese. Manganese. Yeah. yeah. There are a lot, six different types of chemistries. Uh, we, chose, um, we chose the manganese oxide, lithium ion manganese oxide, because of the high discharge capability. 
thinking we needed that. We didn't need it at all, actually, as it turned out. But and they don't catch fire. Like and they don't catch fire. No, I I uh, I got a dud one, uh, and I took it home, and I had a little bonfire outside. I live in the hills, and so I was burning off some rubbish. And I thought, oh, I'll get one of those batteries and see what happens when I put in the fire and it catches fire. Because you hear all these stories about how they explode and blow out with purple flame. So I had a high expectations. And so I, I put it in the fire and I stand and watching it. And I thought, oh, hang on, I might, might just step back a little bit. And so, and then uh, a bit more because I thought it's getting hotter and hotter. And eventually it went, <laughs> and that was it, just pssst. So when it finally cooled down, I, I, I got it out of the fire. The case was still completely intact. The, the seal in the top had just sort of blown out, didn't catch fire, didn't explode, nothing. So it was terribly sort of anticlimactic. You can almost commercialise that, that concept as, as a, as a I hope he does. He's got to get some money back for his effort. Yeah, well, we, we certainly could because, you know, the, the boards, the design uh, of what I showed you up there, that one there, they were sent off to China and they sent the boards back completed. We had to assemble them, but they, they had a... Uh, an assembly service, but it was pretty expensive. But the boards themselves were cheap, uh, about $3 each or something. But, but even for, um, uh, for your house? Yes, yeah, 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 yeah. I've already thought of that. Yeah, yeah. <coughs> yeah definitely. Because the BMS um, will look after those. It will charge and discharge and, and maintain those in a, in a completely safe state. Yeah. So, and that's all just down to the, down to the microcontroller. That I had a pointer I have here. <coughs> Just down to that microcontroller and the program that we put in there, I engaged one of my students to, to work with me. Um, he'd done the microcontrollers one, the advanced microcontrollers, and, and proved to be very, very adept at it, very good. So I got Constantine to say, do you want to be involved in the, in the solar car stuff and do the program? He said, oh, yeah, yeah, good. So he went off to Darwin with us as well. So rather than me have to do it all, so I sit under a shady tree with an ale and he does the work, so that's good. <coughs> Yeah. yeah, absolutely. Yeah, yeah. Spread it around. Any more questions? I have to be yeah. honest. That that trip to Darwin was no picnic. He was no. not very often seen sitting down with an ale. It was more like <laughs> 20 hours a day. Yeah, it was hard work. Mm. Yeah. But we got there. That was good. Yeah, we survived. Okay. We're still mm. vertical. Yeah, we're still vertical. Yeah, no more questions there. I hope you two are going to hang around to the end yeah. of the meeting yeah. and have a cup of tea because I'm sure people would like to look at yeah, well, that's, what you've got. Yes, Ali, I'd like to do that. Absolutely, it's fascinating. But for now, um, join me in thanking Mark and Tony very much.